from Malaysia, Suhaimi Ali, Assistant Governor. And finally, from board member from Dubai Financial Services Authority, Sabine Lautenschlager. Dr. Hanig, over to you. Yeah, good afternoon. It's uh, 18 past 12, so I would like to welcome you for this first panel, which uh, those of you who actually come regular, regularly to the GPF uh, would recognize that what we are doing here as a first panel is kind of connected to what we did at the last panel in uh, Jordan at the Dead Sea when we actually had the Global Policy Forum there one, one year ago. Now, um, you may remember that at the end of the panel, we had had an impression of a very, very exciting discussion, which I think led me to the promise that we are going to continue this discussion. Um, but, you know, in view of all the events that happened in the meantime, I was actually not aware uh, on which topic we would continue this discussion. I was more thinking maybe we just continue what we discussed, but uh, the recent developments, I think, urge us to broaden the scope. Well, let me uh, perhaps, uh, first of all, introduce the panelists to you and then uh, give you a brief introduction. So I start just uh, to my right. From your side to my, to my left, Aisha Ahmad, Deputy Governor of Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, one of the, un undoubtedly one of the financial inclusion champions in this network. Welcome. We have uh, Rogerio Zanamela, Governor of the Central Bank of Mozambique, who again is not only a champion of financial inclusion, he has also been very, very instrumental in driving our gender-inclusive finance work stream from the outset. Um, apart from that, I think with the broad experience from the IMF over 18 years, so I think the theme that you see here fits very well with your background. And then, of course, we have uh, Sabine Lautenschläger, who was also with us, um, um, also like Aisha, on the last panel. Sabine Lautenschläger is uh, a friend of AFI, um, those of you who deal with financial regulations and especially perhaps also standard setting bodies have come across discussions with Sabine over the last years, but she was of course not only the vice president of the Deutsche Bundesbank, she was also a board member of the ECB when I met her and a professional friendship started because she got excited about financial inclusion. And then of course, we have uh, Suhaimi Ali, who is the assistant governor from Bank Negara Malaysia. Uh, Suhaimi is with us uh, for as long as AFI exists in various roles. And I think you have uh, moved up the ladder during this time. I'm not sure whether you moved up because of financial inclusion, but definitely you, you really stand for a fantastic story that actually Malaysia can present. So thank you very much. Now, with, with no further ado, let us go into this agenda, and um, let's just start by saying that uh, this morning, the opening, I think, was a reflection of what happened over the f past 15 years, not only in the Philippines, but obviously also uh, around the world. So we saw huge progress in financial inclusion over these last 15 years, and um, this is interesting because this uh, growth of financial inclusion happened actually after the financial crisis. So obviously that we had more than a decade of stability helped in bringing financial inclusion forward. And we can now say that 70% of the world's population is financially included. 
Uh, we know that more than 50 countries, some of them are represented here on this panel, now have national financial inclusion strategies. And um, in the AFI network, we have counted more than 1,000 policy and regulatory changes towards financial inclusion. Now, with all this progress, we went to Jordan already and thought, look, um, it maybe it makes sense uh, to discuss financial inclusion um, in terms of uh, is it a task of central banks nowadays? And if so, does it make sense to incorporate it into the mandate? And um, this question on mandate came because we were seeing that there were new players in the financial sector um, as a result of technology moving so fast. We saw that, of course, many of the members uh, now deal with issues of inclusivity, leaving no one behind, forcibly displaced women, youth, even elderly. Um, very lately, we also look after disabled populations. And there's also the issue around green. How can central bankers mitigate the impact of, final, um, of climate change? And especially, is there a case for inclusive green finance? And with all this, we asked the question, is there a mandate? Now, the Jordan panel was actually very, very um, yeah, exciting, I would say, and sometimes even a little bit funny, uh, because we had discussions when, for example, um, when the question came up on the, on the mandate, allow me to quote this, I'm sure you find it online. Uh, Sabina asked Aisha, but how many pairs of shoes do you want to wear as a central banker? <laughs> and Aisha said, when I said, I don't want to know how many shoes you have in, <laughs> in your wardrobe, but perhaps you can share on the range of your activities. And um, I think then we had a very great discussion, which actually ended um, with a conclusion, which I, I liked very much, because those of you and the panelists who have been arguing that perhaps we better take our hands off from a mandate on financial inclusion, at the end said, well, maybe I should be a little bit less orthodox. While those ones who have been totally development-minded, as the central banker said, oh, maybe I should become a little bit more orthodox. Yeah? And this, I think, all ended up in a main conclusion, which was, as a central bank, you can do so many things, you don't have to incorporate this formally into your mandate. Because if you do so, you run the risk of political influence that you don't want, and you don't want to lose your independence. So do all the good things within your independence, but think twice before you go for the mandate. I think that was more or less the conclusion. I, um, the two of you were there. Do you agree, Aisha? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sabina, that was it, no? Now, then we wanted to continue this discussion, which I think is, is an interesting one. <clears throat> but one year down the road, the question is not really so relevant for us. Now, inflation is back, and we do see macroeconomic instabilities. It wasn't exactly like that when we were sitting on that panel in Jordan. Yeah? And, and things have really changed. Here we coined it as the poly crisis. Yeah? I mean, so many in things that, that uh, influence us, geopolitical, environmental, technological, economic stresses, and central bankers, I think, have termed it attack from all sides, right? The policy responses um, to, to that risk are now underway. And, of course, many of us fear that there is a risk to lose the gains of financial inclusion because we move forward with these responses. That is why we have... Um, at this panel, I don't see it, the title now, but the title is actually Building Inclusive Financial Systems Amid Global Uncertainty. And the question really is, um, what are the key features of inclusive financial systems? What does it actually take to build them? Secondly, we would like to understand what is the role of such systems in such an area, era of uncertainty we are currently in. And the third one is, do we actually have a coherent narrative regarding the continued relevance of financial inclusion? Yeah. So this is, uh, so to speak, the background I wanted to set. And if you agree, 
I would uh, perhaps dive right away into the discussion and start my first question with um, <coughs> Assistant Governor Suhaimi. I'm, I have picked you um, uh, deliberately for this because uh, Malaysia stands um, for really 15 years of inclusion and I'm actually, uh, I was a bit uh, embarrassed even this morning when I finally realized that BSP had invited former Governor Zeti. She also could have come to this panel because I think uh, she has uh, a lot of stakes in, in, in what happened in Malaysia. But uh, Suhaimi has had his hands on this for 15 years. And my question to you, Suhaimi, if you allow, is what are inclusive financial systems and what have we learned from the past 15 years about how to succeed in building them? Thank you, uh, Alfred. And first and foremost, uh, allow me to thank uh, Afi and BSP for inviting me to this forum and also for the warm hospitality. Um, in my view, inclusive financial system is one where finance empowers and not exploit participants. If done right, this uh, reduces inequality, uplifts marginalized groups, promote economic and societal advancements. Uh, an inclusive financial system also embodies the idea of ensuring that a diverse array of accessible, affordable, meaningful and high quality financial products and services are available to every segment of the community, including those who have been historically marginalized or underserved by the financial sector. And, but of course, this is uh, easier said than done. Uh, financial inclusion can be a key enabler in achieving better financial outcomes because one, it empowers uh, consumers and communities by equipping them with the relevant knowledge uh, and resources to invest, save, manage, raise, and actively participate in the economy. This in turn ensures that everybody can partake in the journey towards uh, better financial well-being. And uh, in this context, having the right range of financial tools and solutions coupled with what we call the right ecosystem enablers, as mentioned by Governor Zeti earlier today, such as the regulatory regime that ensures fair conduct and improves financial capability and literacy of consumers can play a pivotal role in actually bridging the gap. Um, in Malaysia, uh, we have achieved quite significant progress over the last 20, 15 years or so uh, since the implementation of the financial sector master plan and the financial inclusion frameworks. It has evolved from primarily focusing on building the building blocks for consumer protection and ensuring access to credit to a more deliberate focus on achieving financial inclusion and uh, ensuring greater well-being for the people of Malaysia. And some of the lessons learned, if I may share, which uh, governors actually covered in terms of the ingredients to have the uh, transformative ecosystem for financial inclusion, I would like to take a different spin uh, in terms of the kind of lessons learned uh, that we have uh, observed. One is actually in terms of the need for regulatory adaptability. Uh, our approach has evolved over time to address emerging risks and challenges. There's no one size fits all when it comes to approach to financial inclusion. To be effective, strategies should be calibrated and tailored to address uh, the specific characteristics or challenges faced by the various segments in the population. Uh, for example, uh, the recently licensed digital banks in Malaysia are mandated to primarily serve the underserved and unserved segments of the population, but with simplified regulations subject to the necessary safety and uh, soundness safeguards. Uh, flexibility and adaptability in regulations allowed us to keep pace with changing trends uh, such as technological advancements and uh, changing consumer behavior. Second, the importance of financial education. I don't need to go into much detail on that, but for consumers to be able to make informed financial decisions, it goes beyond just expanding access. Uh, you need to basically have that continuous effort to enhance financial literacy and capability, and also for consumers to be able to understand their rights and responsibilities. The need for continuous monitoring and evaluation, that is important to know what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong that allows you to basically pivot 
and uh, refine or sharpen your strategies for financial inclusion. And last but not least, actually, is on collaboration and partnership. A multifaceted approach, collaborative approach is crucial because at the central bank, you have limited resources, you have uh, limited capability to reach all the target audience. As such, having the right stakeholders to join you in this journey will be important. And, and in Malaysia, similar to what Philippines have, we have worked closely with different government agencies, consumer groups, private, public sector to advance specific areas of uh, financial inclusion. So maybe I can just stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you, so I mean, for giving us this in a nutshell. I mean, uh, maybe all of you are more or less aware that Malaysia nowadays is almost fully included. I think you are at 96%, right? So it's, of course, interesting uh, because you are still very busy with financial inclusion. You, we will find out why this is the case a little bit later. Let us maybe get more input um, on, on what it really takes. Um, and I would like to uh, invite uh, Deputy Governor Aisha Ahmad. Uh, on the following question, which I think is, is, is very relevant in Nigeria as well as it is globally. And this is, how can national financial inclusion strategies be accommodative to the heightened levels of global uncertainty uh, we are now seeing? And what did the experience of COVID teach you about the role of inclusive financial systems in crisis? Thank you. Um, let me join my colleagues here, Tisa and Afi, can you hear me? Okay. And DCB for this amazing, BSB for this amazing um, opening ceremony and all the arrangements thus far. And um, when you were doing the opening, it felt like several years <laughs> since we had that conversation about mandate. And I think what we've seen in the last year has been radical uncertainty and the poly crisis that you talk about. And for me, rather than that, challenging the relevance of financial inclusion as a mandate and as an objective, I think it proves it to be what we need to ensure that we're prepared and resilient for the next crisis. I think that financial inclusion is more than just a goal now. It is the path. It is the path to resilience. It is the path to economic achievement and poverty alleviation. It is the path to a sustainable future. And I think, you know, evolving that um, concept in there, I think, is the answer to the last question you asked, which is how do we, you know, create a coherent, you know, um, um, need or a coherent message around this. So to your specific question around what we learned, you know, from COVID, many jurisdictions found a significant growth in the adoption of digital financial services. And I think the the speed at which things ramped up showed us that we may have been complacent in the past in terms of just how much advancement we've had in the last 15 years, just how much of the building blocks were existent, and that we weren't pushing the boundaries enough in terms of getting the excluded um, segments of society included in digital financial services and getting those that were included to be on using you know, e-channels you know, the infrastructure that had been put in place, the policy frameworks that had been put in place. Some of the examples you gave about the policies that, you know, around agent banking, policies around tiered KYC, you know, um, policies around payments and payment rails and shared infrastructure, and all of the things we're doing about consumer protection. I think those were building blocks that we really left sort of on top. So that was one of the lessons. Another lesson was that cash was still king still very, very cash dependent. Even though, so it was almost like we had a dichotomy in terms of, you have all of these very included people that are using financial services that have three or four products that are engaging with bots and using all of the fancy technology. And then you had this other set 
that were excluded, they're in the rural areas, they don't have a bank account, they don't have a mobile account. And so it showed that cash was still, still, still prevalent. We learned the value of building an interoperable payment rails, an interoperable system. So for the economies that were able to leverage um, payment technology for G2P, it wasn't something that could be created during COVID. It was something that could only be leveraged. And that is the point I'm making about financial inclusion and all the work we do being the past, being, being what we need to build for when the rainy day comes, when we have a similar um, crisis. Um, and finally, maybe I will talk about the role of co-creation, collaboration, public-private sector, because G2P could only work government payments using private sector um, frameworks, working across teams, right, and, you know, um, going and, and performing actions that government could not do. And finally, I think the central banks and the monetary authorities remain critical in creating that special convening power because what we have is the power to put an agenda on the table and to put firepower behind that agenda and to coalesce people around and get everyone pointing to that same, same direction. So COVID proved that, you know, platforms like AFI and all of these things we're doing, and all of these conversations are what make us ready and resilient for whatever comes next, even in this, um, in fact, especially in this time of deep uncertainty. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You want mine? Okay, I can use this. Okay, fine. Look, no, I mean, this is really very rich, and, and I'm trying to take notes, uh, and I know that Robin who, by the way, thanks to Robin, who has uh, conceptualized uh, this uh, session. He will also take the notes, and hopefully we will have um, a short write-up um, um, on all what you have been saying. I mean, I feel provoked, in a way, when I listen to the two of you, uh, um, and I could just say, yeah, you have all these building blocks, ingredients, you have it all, but you guys need to refocus. You, you, need, to, you need to make sure that inflation goes down, right? I mean, isn't that the question, actually? Yes. Totally the question. And when I mentioned being the path and the goal, I think enough research has shown that countries with um, higher financial inclusion tend to have lower inflation rates. When there's an economic shock and an external shock, countries with higher financial inclusion are more able to bounce back from those shocks. There was specific research done around when the agricultural sector is, is included. Um, central bank policies of trying to manage um, price shocks are usually more effective. Monetary policy transmission is more effective. Of course, you know that there's a co uh, correlation between financial inclusion and financial stability because of the ability to then have a more diversified financial system. I could go on and on. The challenge is that financial inclusion is such a long-term game. In the opening, um, I think it was, it was Nosetti, I think I, I hope I got her name right. She said something about financial literacy that struck me, something about it being an ongoing um, challenge. I can't remember how she put it. Unfinished business. Unfinished business, thank you very much. And I think that perspective puts everything in perspective, that it's not an area we would ever um, achieve and you, you never get to the goal. You just need to continue. So I think we are working on that mandate, but we are working on the long-term sustainable part of achieving the price stability and economic growth mandates. So, so if I may just intervene on that point, because, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think for us, you know, we never lose focus on the key mandates of the central bank. And the record speaks for itself. If you look at the inflation in Malaysia, you know, it is actually at the highest, it was like 4%. And now it is trending down to the long-term average of, of about 2 to 3%. So, you know, we are not uh, losing focus on, on the key mandate. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's a perfect moment to bring you into discussion, Sabina. And um, 
I would actually, um, you know, in the context of what we have heard from, uh, from your uh, really deep and broad background on stability, I would like to ask you how does the shift from an era of price and financial stability to one of a war against inflation, how does it affect central banking priorities? Does it? And can financial inclusion continue to be so important for central banks? What's your view? Well, you know, with, with the last sentence, I was happy again. <laughs> and we had a big discussion already before this panel, yeah? Um, talking about trade-offs. Well, I mean, let's be very clear. Yeah, first of all, being boring, yeah, being a lawyer, more or less a kind of consequence of being boring, yeah, being a lawyer. Um, <laughs> at least half of the population believes this, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think a, a central bank should keep to its mandate, and whatever it is in the mandate, it should have fulfill it because, you know, we are not legitimized, hence the parliament gives us our task and then we should fulfill it. If price stability is the primary objective, and I heard it is the case, for example, Malaysia, then price stability should be, you know, the, the primary objective. And if financial inclusion fits into it, and I know I'm not so loved by this idea, yeah, but if financial inclusion fits into it, and I think it fits into it, do not misunderstand me, then it's fine. Yeah? But the price stability is the first and primary objective. And why does it fit financial inclusion into price stability and not the other way around? Because when inflation is too high, the poorest are affected the most. It's very clear. There is no financial inclusion, materially content-driven financial inclusion, yeah, not the, the procedural, but the content-driven financial inclusion, if we do not have price stability. Yeah? Because if prices go high that much, yeah, I mean, nobody cares whether you have an account because you're not able to save as a poor man or poor woman. So price stability is key. Yeah? Um, how does financial inclusion fit into price stability? Well, it's via the transmission channel. We heard about that, yeah. But I think, too, that there is a certain kind of um, understanding within the central bank, yeah, that they do have a goal to uh, promote uh, financial stability as well as social welfare within their mandate of price stability. And there it fits in, yeah. Um, how would I deal now, nowadays, yeah? I would focus on price stability, I have to admit, yeah? There will be nevertheless some staff, yeah? Which, staff which works and promotes for financial inclusion as well as um, um, working on payment system where financial inclusion fits very well into it. So I would not leave it just behind and do nothing. But, but I, I'm, I'm orthodox, I have to admit. Yeah? I, I moved last year a little bit, I, but I like to be recalcitrant. I love this word. Yeah? Um, uh, so being recalcitrant, yeah, I would focus on price stability now. Would not leave financial inclusion out totally, but the first primary objective is to ensure that people who are poor do not get poorer by increasing prices. Sorry, I know you want, you, uh, you want to come in, uh, Swami, just wait a little uh, moment. Um, I understand, yes, uh, as long as it fits in, yeah? This is basically um, the statement. And um, against the background of the statement, I would actually like to ask the same question I asked you, ask uh, Rogerio, yeah? So how does the shift, uh, um, you know, now actually war against inflation, how does it, um, affect the central bank priorities, and do you agree that there is a subordinate role, like price stability, price first, financial inclusion can fit in? What's your view? Is this work or you want to okay. Yes, uh, I'd like to join my colleagues and on behalf of 
Bank of Mozambique to, to ex really express our profound gratitude to the Bank Central of the Philippines, to AF for inviting us, for hosting us, for welcoming us with open arms, for their warm hospitality. It's really touched all of us. We are impressed. For my delegation, it's all of us. We are about seven hours, six, seven, first time in the Philippines. So, so we are excited. We will take very nice memories of this beautiful country and these beautiful people. Now, to the question now. Uh, the way we view it, we, we deal with these issues quite on a normal basis, on a regular basis at the Central Bank of Mozambique, the issues of mandate. I like to separate mandate into, and roles of the Central Bank. Because when you talk about mandate, you reach what the law is. It's about what is explicitly in the law, and if it's in the law, then you have to have the tools that are also in the laws. Uh, when you talk about roles, you, it's a broader term, it's not legal, then I would say yes, the central bank mandate, most central banks have the mandate about price stability in one way or the other. It's in the law, pretty much. It's like, that's the way we are judged by politicians, by society at life. Do we, it's, it's the minimum that society expects from us. But there is much more than what is explicit in the law because there are no explicit tools in the law. That's where financial inclusion comes. It comes in the sense that we do have a role to play in promoting financial inclusion because it's critical. You cannot, in any circumstance, in our countries, achieve inclusive, diversified, equitable development without dealing with those issues. And the central bank is a major player in terms of achieving inclusive growth. It's not the main one, but clearly one of the most important ones. So having that in mind, we have a plan. But we also know as it was very well underlined in the presentation. It was a beautiful presentation here. And even the way it closed, it shows if you are going to leverage, if you're going to really leapfrog and achieve the maximum at high speed on financial inclusion, you cannot be alone. You need to establish strategic partnership. And that steering committee that is there, that showed to us how it works together, not jam with the central bank, what it means, they are not competitors. They are supportive, they are complementary, everybody has a role to play. Central banks alone cannot promote financial inclusion. They need others. But others too, with other central banks, they are tied up. There are very few things they cannot do without the central bank because there is a role for the central bank also to play on, this, on the financial inclusion. I agree with whatever I've said. The fight of, uh, on inflation, the war against inflation, it is critical. And in our communiques for the Monetary Policy Committee, we always stress the importance of price and low inflation. We want to see low and stable inflation so that we can support the most vulnerable one. So we have buy-in from the society and a way also to justify the measures that we have to take to control inflation. So that's where I'll stop for the time being before I can continue on that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Rogeri. Um, well, you know, when I listened to you, I remember, um, this is just a small story, I remember a meeting that we had in Washington, D.C., side by side with a spring meeting a couple of years ago, and actually your predecessor, Governor Gould, uh, yeah, we had a public-private dialogue meeting in a small room, and we had a couple of providers there, and uh, I heard that actually for the very first time, and Governor Gould said, I need you, <laughs> he said. I need you for what I'm doing. I can't do it without you. And I think that was a good start, actually, for our public-private dialogue 
platform. We carry it forward from there. But so Jaime, I know you wanted to say something. Please. You wanted to add, and then I have another question for us. I think, I think I'm going to cover that point. Uh, my point is actually, you know, I think the mandate for possibility is given, right? Uh, but then I think for us, if you have such a narrow mandate on price stability, do you then try to, for example, you have you know, a very narrow range of inflation targeting, for example, then do you run economy to the ground to, to achieve that kind of uh, price stability at the expense of long-term sustainability uh, for the country, for example? And, and that is actually needed to basically you know, build the country forward. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I add. can imagine, well then, one Why don't you thing. add now, and then I have a response and another question for you, yeah. Okay. Please. So maybe we're looking at it wrong. Yes. Uh -huh. Maybe it's not a either or, because I was listening to both of you. Um, and so it is more around the tools. So the mandate remains the same, price stability, financial stability, monetary stability. And where does financial inclusion play as a tool to achieving that? And perhaps the bigger question is, how should policymakers um, devote or ascribe their time to all of these competing priorities? Not how should we be choosing around these priorities? Because we've proven that there's certain aspects of inclusive growth around inclusive financial systems that no one else can do except the central bank. In, um, in Governor Seti's presentation, the last point she made was around leadership. She did talk about collaboration and you know, accountabilities and shared visions, but the leadership bit was important because somebody has to lead the effort, you know, and that's where central banks come in. And I'm yet to see any institution that is better placed than the central bank. Okay, thank you for that. Well, Sabina, I'm sure you have something to say on the either or, but let me also, uh, once you have um, responded to that, perhaps um, turn our attention to another stability dimension. Yeah? And um, uh, this is also important because it's not only the, um, the inflationary environment that has worried you in the, in the past couple of months. Um, I think we have also seen uh, a collapse of, of major banks, and we have seen uh, people running away with money from, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank and things like that, Credit Suisse, and so forth. So I just wanted to ask you then, Sabine, based on this, because you are not only a lawyer, but I think you have been very, very instrumental in crafting global standards as well. Uh, do the new gl global standards, e.g. the Basel IV, the ISSB standards on financial sustainability, EU standards on technology regulation, which are designed to deal with global uncertainty risk, uh, um, um, do they actually produce new sets of unintended consequences for financial inclusion? And what do you think? If that's the case, how should the Global South respond to that? Well, many, many thanks for giving me the chance yeah, to react. Yeah? I, mean, I couldn't agree more to your, um, uh, to your main message that there are different stakeholders who have to work together for financial inclusion. You know, my experience tells me, coming from the European part, yeah, that um, usually the central bank is seen as the one stakeholder who can do everything. They have the brightest people, they can print their own money, so they have the biggest budget, yeah? And therefore, um, um, they, they, they often get all the, you know, the things as a role, may I use your word, yeah, as a role, where politicians do perhaps do not want to touch or do not want to touch the state budget, yeah? So I'm always a little bit cautious. Nevertheless, I agree, and here I would like to make a difference. I mean, coming from a European country where financial inclusion has a different touch to it yeah, than in an African country, for example. I fully understand that the central bank in an African country has to think much more about financial inclusion yeah, than, for example, in Germany. Yeah? Um, also, in Germany too, we need to think about financial inclusion, but in a different way, you know. Um, 
And I love to hear that financial literacy is related and linked to it. So that I thought was a very good idea too, because what does it matter when you have financial inclusion when people do not know how to best use, uh, make the best out of the financial products they are offered. Yeah? So it comes hand in hand. And in financial literacy, one can do a little bit as a central bank uh, too. Um, nevertheless, I'm still orthodox saying, I mean, you should try to, to do your price stability first. Yeah? Um, good, now coming to the standards. And perhaps I, I, yeah, I answer this with the either or. I think it's not either or or. It is related and it's connected too. You know, as I said that without f price stability, you will not have financial inclusion. Without financial stability, you will not have financial inclusion, it's all a little bit about the medium and long-term perspective. Yeah? So if we do not fight climate change, yeah, uh, we do not have to care about financial inclusion um, anymore. So rules about sustainability, yeah, um, they, they have a medium and long-term perspective, which more or less help find the basis for financial inclusion. Uh, rules about financial stability like um, Basel IV yeah, will help or um, um, rules about technology innovation yeah, will help to promote a financial inclusion on a stable basis on the medium and on the long term. So for me it is not either or or. It's rather a question of if you look on the short term perspective how do you balance, and we talked about that already, how do you balance the different needs and the different interests, yeah? And now to your second question, what should the Global South do? Yeah? I, I believe, yes, um, and you can see this, in, by the way, in the uh, global standards of the last two, three years, where the, the idea of proportionality yeah, uh, took up a, a bigger role, yeah? That the rules, are designed nowadays with a bigger thought on proportionality, yeah, taking into account that if you have a small business, the risk for AML, for example, is much smaller. Yeah? And that you need to adjust your national transformation from global standards into national law with a kind of proportionality idea. I can tell you proportionality is close to my heart, I was called Miss Proportionality at the Basel Principal um, uh, Group, yeah? Because in Germany we have so many small banks and you know, they cannot take all these very complex modeling things, yeah? So my, every second wor word was proportionality. So I think this can be a solution um, to work, you know, to get a kind of balance between, for example, um, financial innovation, digitalization, uh, the risk of cyber, the risk um, of AML, um, having a kind of balanced system, how much cyber security do I need in order to protect the consumer? Yeah? I mean, if you want them to do savings, but they will lose their savings to a cyber attack, it makes not much sense. So there needs to be a certain kind yeah, of rule setting around it, but it needs to be proportional. So do we have unintended consequences? I fear with regard to the short term, but on the medium and long term, it all um, promotes a more stable and safe environment in order to have uh, economic success in financial inclusion. And not only to count the adults who have an account but to count the adults who have an account use financial products economically for their better status in life. So, so you're basically saying in the shorter and medium term, yes, there are unintended consequences. In the longer run, it will actually balance off and we will be okay. Yes, yes. and mm. we should balance the shorter and medium term yeah. unintended mm. consequences with this kind of proportionality. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, principle. And this is the biggest role, I think, for central bank, as we do not have always the mandate for everything what yeah. is yeah. politically wise, you know, yeah. 
but where other stakeholders should yeah. come in, but we yeah. have a mandate to advise usually mm -hmm. the government. Mm -hmm. And there we can take our knowledge, our experience to the government and mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. they will listen. Well, well that, that, I mean, just as a joke, don't take it seriously. I mean, in school what we learned, I mean, John Maynard Keynes would have told you in the long run we are all dead, no? No? <laughs> yeah, but in between we want to live a good life. Huh? <laughs> Wonderful. All of us. <laughs> Great. Anyway, Rogerio, yeah, uh, we talk about the Global South perspective on these uh, global standards, and of course, um, uh, I, I think Sabine and I, we are very much on the same page when it comes to proportionality. My question is, is it a principle or is it a living concept? I fear, you know, as I was been reflecting on these issues of proportionality. Is it? Yes. So I've been attending some of the meetings in Basel where you're all there, and that's sort of like a buzzword now. When you sort of anybody who comes and challenge global standards, and and then because they don't want to touch them, in reality. The reluctance to touch them, they'll say, oh, no, 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 <laughs> we will do proportionality. <laughs> so you calm down, just go home, <laughs> and everything. But there are consequences to proportionality. That's what they don't tell us. There are consequences, because what I have seen from the last few years I've been governor, and they say, wait a minute, we have, to some extent, these global banks, they have been operating in our systems. And then suddenly, you begin to see them withdrawing their operation, divesting, getting out, selling, finding a buyer. And at the end of the day, when you try to figure out what is going on, because then they have to consolidate their operations with the parents. And as they consolidate, then they apply global standard. They don't apply proportionality. <laughs> so that's a reality. They don't. I mean, I'm Wait, you by they don't apply. No, they don't apply. So it's, it, it's a trend. It's going on even in my I've seen in some of the operation in Mozambique. And then you say, wait a minute, they are hypocritical about it because they really... A selling is something that is not working. We need the presence of these banks, but these banks are going to be there, intermediate our savings and playing a role in our development. They can't pass because the cost of operating in our system are significantly much higher than in the global north. Because we have some other challenge locally. So for them to operate in our system, they need some incentives. They don't get incentives. They feel like they have been punished. Get out. Okay, fine. We can't. There are no rooms. So that's the issue. That's the problem we have. Until that issue is addressed, the implications of that, then it's real lip service. I don't think the global north in that sense has been very honest about it. Because we are dealing with the consequences of proportionality in those terms. So unless they allow those banks there in the parents to consolidate different than the way they do now, which I doubt they will do it, then we are in trouble. Also, no, we are thank talking. You. Yeah. So, I mean, short on the short, yeah. standards. And, and, and I think, to uh, you know, I totally agree with what Governor uh, mentioned. Uh, it's just that in Malaysia, because the way our financial system is structured, so we have predominantly domestic players as large institutions, so this problem is not as entrenched in, in Malaysia. But I have uh, some response in terms of how should global south uh, deal with this. One is actually, of course, the voices need to be heard, and AFI is actually a good example of such a platform to be able to do this and, you know, uh, to engage with the international uh, standard setting body. Uh, and we have actually been doing that because I sit on the uh, GSPC of, of AFI, so there are engagement in terms of making sure that in areas where new regulations have impact on financial inclusion, the voices is actually heard 
But to be a bit more provocative, the global north will also need to do their part in assisting global south, as many of these policies are really the outcome or response to the problem that they created, right? Uh, and and uh, taking climate as an example, uh, the global north must acknowledge that the global south is still the developing state and hence a lot of infrastructure has yet to mature and stabilize to address the climate uh, issue, which was historically caused by the global north, the, the climate problems. Uh, and, and this requires huge sum of money. So as responsible global north, they must lend a helping hand, not talk only or commit only to global south to enable them to also achieve a just and orderly transition. And the helping hand can be in the terms of access to affordable funding, technical capacity, and technology. Otherwise, there is a high risk of jurisdictional exclusion and also widening of inequality. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, it's a great panel, huh? But, Aisha. I would like to give you also the opportunity to respond to the question on the Global South. Okay. Then I will allow Sabine to respond very briefly, and then it's your turn. Please. Okay. Um, I think a lot of conversation has happened around what Global North should be doing. Let me just emphasize some of the, the impact, you know, of this um, move towards more standards and all of that. I think compliance costs for financial institutions would go up. And those compliance costs are not just in the physical resource costs, it's also the mindset cost. Um, this can affect financial inclusion because financial institutions may then sort of put that on the wayside and say it's just gonna cost us too much. Capital requirements are good because we know that going into COVID, the reason why the global financial um, industry was more resilient was because of the post-global financial crisis reform. So we know that capital is important, but for emerging markets and the global south, those capital requirements have serious consequences for institutions, you know, looking at underserved populations and something that, you know, policymakers should really be focusing on. One of the things we try to do in Nigeria is to promote shared infrastructure, try to get that shared infrastructure to create value that can be you know, passed on to consumers. We've had lower um, G2P, sorry, lower P2P transfer costs, you know, sig progressively. You know, we've tried to see how we could look at shared platforms for microfinance, because increasingly people forget that deposit money banks, you know, they, they can afford to have these fancy technology you know, platforms to use, but smaller institutions, microfinance, don't really have that. So creating a shared platform for that you know, can be useful as well. And I think finally, um, policymakers should be looking at how you can manage consumer protection to ensure that customers are not unduly um, um, charged. On standards, the Global South is not having the conversations it needs to be. We're not in the room when the standards are being formed. And we need to have more engagement in that respect. For instance, stuff around that data privacy, you know, um, the international cooperation on cybersecurity, for example. Some of these important conversations that actually affect how we use technology, how we consume technology in the Global South, we need to have our voices heard. And I think the Global North needs to understand the peculiarities of our systems and not create these one-size-fits-all you know, frameworks that actually do more to regress our progress than to advance it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aisha. I mean, uh, just to give you the context, um, I would think a lot has changed in the past decade when it comes to the discussions with the SSBs. I think Sabine had already acknowledged, I mean, there's a lot of discussion around proportionality. And when I look back like um, 10, 15 years ago, that was different. It's another funny example. Uh, um, and I can't give you the author of this example. It's really funny because when I started with all this, you know, we were sitting 
I think it was colleagues from Latin America, and they were actually sitting with the standard setting bodies, and they were telling me that it is so difficult to explain to somebody from Central Europe that there are people out there who don't have a physical address. Yeah. Because we all have a physical address. So, but the standards actually said, if you no have a physical address, you don't get a bank account. But in the meantime, we have found ways no, to actually tier uh, the KYC in such a way proportionate you know, that you know, also these people can get access. I think that's, that's, and I think building on this more is to become, uh, to, uh, going to come, and I think you are pointing the way um, uh, more needs to be done. And I think this is why, coming back to the context of this conference, why actually BSP has been pushing us to issue the Manila Manifesto, because that is there actually to enhance the cooperation and collaboration with the global standard setting bodies, which I think is great. And lastly, for the very first time, Robin is sitting there. Um, we, we, we have been invited um, uh, by the uh, BIS um, Financial Stability Institute for um, 30 November, 1st October, for the first time to co-organize um, a conference around virtual assets and financial inclusion. With, which, uh, with Fernando Restoy, uh, I think that's, that's good because uh, we will bring, of course, our members and, you know, try to make the voices heard on these very pertinent issues. Anyway, Sabine, you wanted to uh, react briefly? Well, first of all, I would like to join you, yeah? I think really that the Global North should, uh, you know, give a helping hand, yeah, to the Global South. I fully agree uh, to you. And I do not only agree to this because I believe that um, uh, yeah, a healthy part of the prosperity in North is built on the work of the South. Let's be very clear. Yeah? Um, but I think so too because I believe that the geopolitical uncertainty nowadays yeah, um, should make everybody think about, you know, how to invest in long-term relationships, yeah? And um, this is always helped by a helping hand, yeah? Um, coming to your um, uh, comment, um, um, I, I couldn't agree more. I experienced in Germany, um, secret, <laughs> I experienced in Germany the same in 2008 and 2009. Um, when the financial crisis hit, um, short before that, we had a lot of global banks, non-German banks, uh, non-European banks, yeah, um, financing or offering very cheap financing to the German um, Mittelstand, you know, the SME, the backbone of the German economy, yeah. Um, because they were much cheaper. Everybody moved to the American banks, to the English banks, and didn't take the German banks, yeah? And then as soon as the financial crisis hit, and these banks got a lot of taxpayers' money, yeah? The government said, well, first, you will give loans um, to your home country um, companies and not to foreign companies, and they all moved out of Germany. And all of the middle stand, we said, stood there naked, you know? So they all moved into having now German banks <laughs> yeah? because they, they exactly experienced this kind of moving out um, um, of a country and having then afterwards a problem with regard to liquidity, with regard uh, to loans, etc. So what is the solution? I mean, I do not have to tell you. Yeah, first of all, for sure, global banks should acknowledge proportionality yeah, and there should be a consolidation method and concept which can acknowledge that. That is the next step. You know, it, it, it takes too long. I absolutely understand yeah, that it takes too long, but the first step is to do these kind of financial standards to more or less express as a global standard setter. Yeah? We want to have this kind of proportionality. Then you need to convince the national jurisprudence, you know, you need to convince the Department of Justice in the US, yeah, that it is, yeah, well, yeah, that it is fine to have proportional AML rules, etc. This is the next step, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, 
for me, this is so short-sighted for global banks to move, move out of Africa because Africa will be the next most important region, for example, yeah? looking into the geopolitical uh, context. Yeah? So with a little bit of um, political mindset, not short-term, yeah, in these developed countries, yeah, it should move forward much quicker than it did in the last 10 years, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, with all these uncertainties yeah. happening yeah. Yeah, right now, I believe yeah. that there is a chance. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, with COVID, I mean, terrible thing, yeah? But there was one good thing coming out of it, much quicker digitization, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, much more financial inclusion because of the digitization coming out, the need and the necessity to do it not face-to-face, -face, but via, uh, you know, the computer. And, and I do hope that with regard to this terrible geopolitical uncertainty we have right now, there will be coming out some good things uh, for yeah. the poorer regions. Thank you very much. And, and thanks also for pointing out again the geopolitical uh, issues that are going on. I mean, just uh, to take an intermediate step here, it might even uh, lead us to recognize whether this, or the question at least, does this Global South, Global North actually still makes sense. That, does the pattern still fit? I think perhaps something to think about. But we have talked about monetary stability and financial inclusion. We have talked about financial stability and financial inclusion. Um, and we have talked about the relationship between uh, these three. And I think we have uh, heard various um, statements around this seems to be some emerging consensus, we will see, but let me now take a temperature check with this audience here. We have an audience which is full of central bankers and the rest of the global ecosystem on financial inclusion. Do we have any questions or additions? Um, would be great if you could uh, be uh, crisp and concise in the question, if there's any. And if there's any, I know that there are people with microphones to help you but I can't fully see because uh, we look like rock stars here in front of the audience and we cannot really see who's uh, actually throwing things at us. Yes, please. Thank please you. Please identify thank you. yourself. Yeah? yeah. My name is Roberto. I'm from Central Bank of El Salvador and thank you for all your insights and comments. I just wanted to say that I came to a thought when you were talking about the medium term, short term trade-offs, balances and that in the long term we're going to be dead. But before dying, we have to live in a good manner, so we have to do something before dying. So, My comment would be like, I think financial inclusion should be taking into consideration the economic cycle. What I mean by this is that a financial inclusion policy should be aggressive when we have expansion. Because if we are in a recession or depression, what would be the point of someone having an account if we don't have nothing to eat? We need to provide to our families. We need money to get into the account. So if financial inclusion was taken into consideration the economic cycle, it would be exponentially better. Thank you for the, for the comment. Um, uh, is there another hand? Please. Yes, yeah, thank I, you very much. Uh, it's also a comment. With your permission, I want to remain seated. Yes. I, I'm not in a classroom. You, you are. <laughs> I'm Paul Mendy, uh, Deputy Governor, Central Bank of the Gambia. Thank you. Uh, my comment is a slight deviation from what I just heard, uh, because I want to agree entirely with the panel regarding inflation and the issue of not being either or. Uh, and I say this because to me, uh, if inflation is, uh, is high, it's a form of a regressive tax system where the impact is felt harder at the lower level of society. To the extent that tackling inflation, in my view, uh, is, is already part of the inclusive financial system uh, at work. So the, uh, but then at the same time, it is right to note that, uh, the, as the panel said, inflation and uh, the other bits that we consider as a central banker is like uh, going to a market to prepare a, a, a nice dish. Uh, you go to market, you don't just buy one commodity, but you buy is a package of things. And uh, in central banking, 
there is, of course, a scale of preference, form of scale of preference, where to me, inflation should be really number one, but there has to be other things so that the basket of commodities is complete. Thank you. Thank you. So we got confirmation of one position and uh, I would like to know whether there is more. Yeah, in the front, please. Is it Elsie? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Elsie from Ghana, Bank of Ghana. Um, I just want to agree with everything the panelists have said, but I just want to stress that um, I think financial inclusion is really an outcome or, or one of the many outcomes if central banks are keeping to their mandate. Um, whether it's price stability and financial stability or, uh, pri or, or and or, um, if you're doing the work well, um, it will lead to many outcomes, including financial inclusion, right? And, and central banks are very savvy in interpreting their mandates. Uh, I, like Sabine, also have a legal uh, background, so I think in terms of mandates. But we all know there's a common sense approach to interpreting uh, statutes. And, and central banks, when they want to be creative with their statutes, with their mandates, they know how to do it. That's how come we have quantitative easing, right? Uh, that's how come we have many fancy things that central banks have done uh, since the global financial crisis and recently that we never imagined was possible, right? Uh, but they have a clever way of interpreting their mandate, and that's really a common sense approach at looking at the mandates. Uh, you have a mandate for price stability. What does it mean if half of the economy is outside the formal system? Right? Informal businesses, cash-based economies, how are you ever going to conduct your monetary policy? So there's a common sense uh, imperative uh, to bring everyone into the fold. Um, what are you going to do with your financial stability mandate if banks are wanting to think, are thinking of their capital ratios and all of that and therefore are packing money um, in instruments that are uh, risk-free, for example, and not intermediating, which is the reason why you license them. You license them to intermediate. Inter effective intermediation should produce financial inclusion, should ensure that um, the poorest of the poor have access to loans, you know, when they need it, because they take your savings and my savings and, and give them out to the most productive parts of our economy, which in many of our countries is the informal sector. Um, but if you interpret your financial stability mandate as, well, I want to look at ratios, uh, bank balance sheets that are strong, um, whether banks are doing the work for which we license them or not, right? Um, and so we want safety and soundness of these banks. We want stability, but we also want them to do the work for which we license them. So again, it's a common sense approach. And if we're doing this well, then the outcome is financial inclusion, among other things. Thank um, you so much. So that's what I would say. Great, great, great. But may I, may I one, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly, comment? exactly. Wait, this wait. One? No, 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 exactly. The question, uh, you can actually drill it down to, what do you do with your financial stability mandate if banks don't intermediate, or can I say, follow the path of de-risking. Ah, okay, now. Um, well, I think looking at the last 10, 12 years of rulemaking in the international um, um, standard set of bodies, you can see that the complex banking part, you know, where we do not talk about giving loans to small, medium-sized business or to even big business, but usual loan credit business, yeah? Um, but where we are talking about financial engineering by making money, I always say out of nothing because there is no real value behind it. It's not real economy. This got much more expensive the last 12 years, you know, via the capital standards, which were raised dramatically. Yeah. So I think um, you always have to see both sides. When you do this financial engineering stuff, when you make it more expensive because you raise the capital 
standards or you raise, um, you, you delete the modeling part where, you know, they could calculate themselves down in the capital uh, level. Then you, on the other side, you make these normal bread and butter business, as we call it in Germany, you make it more attractive. Yeah. So when looking on having a diversified small loan business as a bank, you get quite a preferential treatment, at least in Europe, I can tell you, we get quite a preferential treatment because you see the diversification of risk. You have a huge portfolio of small um, loans where when some um, uh, will not follow their uh, obligations to pay back their loan, it doesn't matter because the overall portfolio um, is having a good um, uh, status. So this got a lot more attractive. So I think the incentives were set correctly the last 10 to 12 years with regard to this very important bread and butter uh, business. Yeah, that I would like to, to add. Um, nevertheless, I did, I mean, last, this year I was in Angola um, for one week uh, looking there at the financial market. And um, I mean, there are, still, um, there are still some incentives in banks which, for example, can hinder yeah. the usual intermediation with this. For example, when a bank can make more money with buying government bonds and getting the interest in the government bonds yeah, um, uh, back, then by um, shedding out um, uh, loans. Yeah? So there is a certain kind of interconnection between having um, a stable financial environment as well as a stable government budget to uh, be precise. So there are different bases to cover in order to move forward you know, with um, having banks um, with an economic sense um, giving loans to the, 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 the customers we would like them um, to serve. Well, thank you. Um, so, I mean, maybe you, you can Just say a short it. one. Very to, short. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. To, then to go respond ahead. to that, you know, I totally okay. agree with, with what you said, that, you know, a lot of it is common sense. But the issue is common sense is not so common. <laughs> and, and otherwise, we don't need to be here yes. discussing yes. this issue. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, next to Shirley, I think we have a, a hand. Please, please identify yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tilda Nabanja Turiagenda from Bank of Uganda. I would like to first of all thank uh, Afi for the distinguished panelists that have articulated the topic uh, quite accurately and uh, in an inspiring manner that has provided us uh, a way forward on a number of issues. Now, the question that I have uh, possibly uh, can be answered by uh, any of the panelists, uh, but most importantly, um, the representative from uh, Malaysia, which has actually achieved over 96% uh, financial inclusion, if I got that correctly. Now, when I look at financial inclusion from the perspective of Uganda, uh, in my opinion, it looks more of a catalyst to the macroeconomic development of the country. So you find that much as the mandate of the central bank is focused on stability, uh, as has been mentioned by the panelists, you find that financial inclusion has brought, has demystified a lot of these issues to the common person in the country. And therefore, much as we say leaving no one behind, it has also enabled everyone to feel part of the development process. So my question to the panelists from Malaysia is that, from your experience, how have you um, benefited from the financial inclusion agenda to see that it seamlessly contributes to the mandate of the central bank without uh, derailing it uh, from achieving uh, the key objectives. Secondly, 
how have you positioned financial literacy in your organization to see that it's still given the importance that it has without derailing uh, uh, the bank from achieving its key uh, mandates? The other question generally to the panelists is on the issue of um, the level of investment by the central bank, especially with the latest developments globally. Now you find that much as we are heading towards um, a more digitalized financial system, there is a lot of infrastructure gaps that we have in some of our economies. Okay. And yet, uh, if you depended on funding from the global north, it's no longer coming in in the volumes that uh, were envisaged by the south. So what tips can be given to the economies in the south to harness some of these efforts from within to see that you can still advance the uh, developments that can enable you to have the good infrastructure to efficiently run a digitalized financial system. And as that is being answered, I would like to also understand. Um, um, can I, can I, uh, I mean. Okay, I'm, I'm actually, just winding no, no, up. Hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. Because okay. I'm actually quite um, a complex person, I think, but. There's a full basket of questions, and maybe we can first, if you don't mind, because we also uh, need okay. to uh, finish this. By. But thanks so much for the question. We have two very precise ones for Bangladesh, Malaysia, and then uh, there's a question on investment, and perhaps uh, okay. I can bring Thank you, you in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Uh, I'll answer the second question first, because that's easier. Uh, so basically, you know, we have financial inclusion in our mandate but it is not ranked uh, at the same level as the primary mandate of monetary stability and uh, financial stability. And uh, in uh, delivering on that particular mandate, we have a dedicated function within the central bank called Financial Inclusion Department that looks at the financial inclusion issue ends to end. Uh, and, and that's how we basically ensure continued focus on inclusion to ensure that we manage and be able to do the balancing act with other primary objectives on almost a weekly basis, we have what we call a policy working group that meets to discuss any policy that the Central Bank of Malaysia will be issuing. And that brings together people from monetary stability, financial stability, market conduct, financial inclusion, and everybody who is actually relevant to basically discuss, is there a trade-offs? If there are trade-offs and the stability concern needs to take precedent, and then how do you then manage uh, the effect on financial inclusion and what kind, what kind of alternative arrangement that can be put in place so that the focus on financial inclusion is not diluted? On uh, your question with regard to you know, financial inclusion objective complementing the primary mandate, I have uh, four points. One is actually on a monetary policy mandate in keeping inflation low and stable. Price stability benefits all segments of the society, especially those in the lower income groups who would be disproportionately affected by higher inflation. So in our case, because we were able to manage inflation quite well, uh, that has not been uh, an extreme pressure on inflation, thereby it has largely preserved the debt servicing capacity of borrowers. On uh, monetary policy transmission, uh, greater financial inclusion, especially through onboarding via formal or regulated FIs, can enhance the transmission of monetary policy by increasing the responsiveness of household and businesses to changes in the interest rate and other policy instruments. And this helps central banks to achieve their monetary policy objectives more effectively. Three, on economic resilience, Financial inclusion can contribute to a more resilient economy, more inclusive financial services, can help facilitate population's ability to adjust their saving, consumption, and investment patterns, ultimately enabling them to withstand economic shocks and navigate period of uncertainty. And fourth, on financial system resilience, financial inclusion is likely to improve the resilience of financial institutions, given the broader base of deposit funding, and more diversified loan portfolios. And expanding access to formal financial services also reduces the reliance on informal financial services, which would 
in turn enhance the overall resilience of the financial system. However, it can be quite challenging uh, to achieve all of them without any uh, balancing act. Therefore, understanding the synergies and trade-off is important to strike the right balance. Uh, for example, setting the policy rate high to contain inflation can meet monetary stability objective, but can be at the expense of burdening the financial sector, higher cost of deposits with lesser ability to repri reprice loans due to competition, and burden borrowers with higher cost of borrowing, and potentially affecting financial inclusion outcomes. And this has to take into account then the consequences beyond first order effects. So these are some of the examples in terms of how we have actually been managing uh, the financial inclusion objective that we have within the primary mandate of stability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sahaimi. Thanks a lot. Aisha. Do you want me to take the question around investment? Okay, um, maybe two ideas in a very short time I can give you. I think the first one is that um, it's monitoring and evaluation becomes very important because development partners and funders, Global North funders would be, their mandates or their objectives in the Global South would not change. Yes, there may be financial capability issues which make them be probably prioritized more. And that's where monetary evaluation comes in because the data that comes out of monetary evaluation where you can demonstrate impact of the funding that has come before should make you more um, retain the ability to attract more funding. But beyond sort of external funding, I think central banks should increasingly try to leverage their, their private, um, private institutional ecosystems. What I mean by that is that, you know, for example, a good example is financial literacy. In Nigeria, we're encouraging all the banks to in, include financial literacy programs as part of their CSR. They're delivering products anyway. They're delivering financial services. In that delivery mechanism, you can actually put in something there where you're able to teach and learn. We've digitized our financial literacy framework. We have a portal called Sabi Money. That is a more sustainable model for funding financial literacy programs because then you can then broadcast this to millions of people. You can use radio, for example. You can assess to know what areas have been covered, and that's where you don't have to spend on certain aspects of um, financial knowledge if you think that the populace are already there. So for me, I think it's not really about attracting funding per se. Today, it's about being more effective, right? Leveraging some of the earlier spend and then using data and um, digital technology to make every dollar or every local currency spend go that much further. Thanks. Thank you. I think that's a very good clarification. Um, before I actually now invite you for a last quick round to um, sum up this panel, uh, Rogerio, maybe the first or last bigger question I would like uh, to bring up. In view of all this, what we and you have heard today now, how, how best to demonstrate the continuing relevance and complementarity of financial inclusion to the urgent priorities of central banks to combat inflation and maintain financial stability. Is it possible to avoid policy trade-offs and achieve all of these objectives simultaneously? Yes, I think it's possible. Uh, as I, was, I said earlier, you know, there's one objective that is clearly the primary mandate of the central bank. It's about price stability, which also has implication for financial inclusion because by addressing inflation, you deal with inequality, you can deal with poverty issues, and so on. So that's an important thing. On financial inclusion, again, I said, there is a role and not an insignificant, I would say a significant role for central banks to play on financial. We do have tools to have an impact on financial inclusions. But if we are going to get the maximum return out of that in terms of maximizing where we want to be, we cannot be alone. Mm -hmm. It's important 
that we get other institutions to come along to complement what central banks are doing. Because it's very limited what central banks can do. And so if you bring other institutions there to come into place, not as a competitor, but to support as a complement, then I will say yes, it is possible to achieve both objectives, but not alone. Like, you know, and that's exactly what we heard this morning here. The experience of Bank Central of Philippines, it's exactly that that is possible, but don't try to do it alone. Get partnership, what we will call strategic partnerships. Collaborate. It's important collaboration. Whatever framework you can develop, they had one, but can't have to look at a way to effectively collaborate because financial inclusion, it's not an option. It's really crucial, it's essential. We will never be able to achieve justice. We will never be able to achieve inclusive development, equitable development without addressing this issue. So it affects all of us. So we need to be together. So that's the way I will put it. Is. Thank well, you. That's very clear. Thank you. Wow. I will now ask you for your last uh, one minute reflection, Sabine. Well, I mean, this was almost the best final message huh? for, from my perspective. Yeah. Um, perhaps I, I would like to add, yes, uh, we all have to work together. And it's not only the central bank. Um, I would like to put a focus again on financial literacy because I truly believe, you know, it's, I mean, you, you see this with the, with, with the Philippine Central Bank. I mean, the, um, um, the presentation was excellent. You could see very well, you know, how, how the steps were done and how it improved. Yeah? So uh, I commend uh, the Central Bank for, the, for this kind of progress. Yeah? Um, the first step is to get people to get an account. You know, the second step is to have knowledge in this population, how to best use, uh, make the best use of these financial products they, they, are, go um, they are going to be offered. This, the third one is to find, um, to find a kind of legal stabil stability, to have um, a legal system within a country which creates a stability and a certainness in order to um, promote investments coming in yeah? because people um, um, like to give money and invest if they know um, that there is a certain legal uh, system there which keeps yeah, um, the rights um, in, in, in an orderly way, you know, where there is an orderly uh, system. So this is all something what needs to be stepped up and there where people have to work together. That's why I believe, yes, the central bank has a role in there in particular with regard to the payment system, etc. But we need to ensure that all of the stakeholders, and here I mean um, the parliament, um, the executive, um, the legal system, is up to the task too, because otherwise it will, um, it will stay on the first step having an account. But this is only the first step in order to, make, to give more prosperity um, uh, to the poorest. Thank you. Your one minute statement. Sorry. Four quick points on advancing inclusion. One is actually there need to be deliberate intent and design of financial inclusion strategies because that would actually help align actions by all the key stakeholders. Second, reg regulatory adaptability with clear problem statement and understanding of the risks and challenges. Uh, with blurring of finance, the central bank will need to keep pace of what's happening elsewhere uh, to be able to deliver on this particular area. Third, careful calibration, taking into account policy trade-offs or the need for balancing acts. Uh, and last but not least, of course, the need for collaborative and whole of nation approach uh, because there's a limit, as mentioned by governor, in terms of what financial sector can do. There's not going to be much meaningful financial inclusion outcome if people are poor or have no income. Thank you. Thank you, so Jaime. Well, um, Aisha, my question to you is basically, what do you take away from here? I always love these conversations, particularly with Sabine, because it reminds me 
of what, we don't forget what the primary mandate is, but sometimes we tend to sort of go deep into the social issues. Um, and so it's a good reminder. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so I feel that, yes, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a poly crisis, but that the core of what we should be remains, would re over the long term, would remain what it is, financial stability, price stability, financial inclusion. I see financial inclusion, like I said from the beginning, not just a destination. It's the journey. It's the path. It's the tool with which we would be more resilient when the next crisis comes. And I think we know for certain there will be one. We just don't know how it would be. Without financial inclusion, we will not be able to rescue the most vulnerable when that time comes. We will not be able to have effective policies to recover, and we would actually be deepening exclusion. And that is what this has told me, that we, we just need to continue. Platforms like this need to continue. We need to keep learning, and we need to be comfortable with that uncertainty, knowing that all the steps we're taking today will be for the very best. Thanks. Thank you very much for this high-level perspective. My goodness, if I had the time, I, I sat down and, and write a policy paper on this. Uh, but Robin is there. I'm not saying you have the time, Robin, but we have to document this session. Wow. Now, let me uh, just say, well, I mean, you have summarized it so nicely, and um, we are running out of time. So I do understand from this, uh, there's no either or. Um, I do understand that partnerships are important. I do understand that leadership is important. I do understand that voice towards the global standard setting bodies is important. Uh, but if I had uh, to summarize it in one sentence, I would say financial systems can only be stable when they are also inclusive, but it's also the other way around. We are discussing of what comes first, but I, I hear a consensus that there is a primary objective around this table. Well, before I go, quick pitch. Don't forget to come tomorrow to our session where we introduce a research project where we are going to look based on you know, five country cases within AFI network into data that can actually help us to finally document why there is complementarity between monetary stability, financial stability, and financial inclusion. That might help us. And you know, since we are now walking away again from this panel, and since we are not going to be dead in the short run, <laughs> we might meet again and discuss these issues further. Thank you very much. Please give me your hands and clap for this wonderful panel. And uh, I thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming and sharing with us. Ladies and gentlemen, how was that for the first plenary session of the 2023 AFI GPF? Thank you very much, Dr. Hanig and our very insightful panelists. Now, delegates, we will be breaking for lunch. Lunch will be served in the hall, the reception hall right across. We request that you be back here by half past two or 2.30 so that we can promptly start the next plenary session. This will be uh, the leader's public-private dialogue. And uh, for those who will be attending the IGF leaders' lunch and gender focal points lunch, please proceed to the mezzanine foyer of the reception hall. You will find that if you go to the reception hall and go up a flight of stairs. So everyone, I know you have questions, but that's what lunch is for. Please seek those people that you would like to ask questions to. Enjoy your lunch, everyone.